Hello. All right. So let's see here. Alondra, if you don't mind, uh, nice to meet you, by the way. Uh, what's your last name? It's Shuck. I I'm sorry? It's Shuck. Shuck, okay. Shuck. Great, great. Got you. All right, Destiny. Great. Well, it's nice to meet you. I don't know uh, uh, how much you've been able to, uh, to check out uh, regarding the class before we begin, um, but uh, we're gonna have argumentative assignments. Uh, every, uh, it's gonna oscillate from every four days to every five days. And uh, we'll have about 12, well, we won't have 12, well, yeah. We, we should have about 12 of them and uh, 12 to 13 assignments. I'm not sure if I have you do reconstruction or not. I have to look at the, uh, at the syllabus and see if you had time. And then you'll have three tests and, uh, and the tests are almost solely from the argumentative assignments. Okay. And so, uh, I, so, so much of my class comes from those argumentative assignments. I just feel like um, I want I want history to be useful to people and uh, those of you who are not majoring in history, and it encourages you to critically think. At least I try to, uh, and I feel like you, uh, those of you who do want to move on to be history majors, it'll help you uh, prepare you for what lies ahead, because they have um, historical. Uh, discourse on different topics, right? Um, that will uh, include uh, debate, uh, especially when it comes to causation, right? In history, that's very subjective. Uh, what caused something to happen? Uh, and so uh, different historians, they select different facts, choose to omit different facts. They uh, interpret the facts differently sometimes, and they present them differently. And so there's a lot of subjectivity in history now, I wanted to take advantage of that instead of being frustrated with it and having you memorize dates and names, uh, which I don't think is of much use for your life. So at any rate, um, I hope you find it a little less boring if you're not a history major and, uh, and just, uh, just keep you know, honing your critical thinking skills. I wanna encourage you to read all of them, okay? Because I have virtually something on the test from virtually every uh, argumentative section of every assignment that I give out. I, that, that's scarcely uh, an exaggeration. So be sure that you read all the sections, uh, but most of the time I'll ask you to simply choose one uh, to analyze and to evaluate. And by analyze, right, I just mean pick apart. It, it's not much different from a summary in my mind, is you're discerning, right, the, the critical message, the thesis statement in that section. And then you're also picking apart how it is defended, uh, what type of data, maybe give me an example uh, in, in your analysis. So maybe just kind of uh, immediately state what you believe to be the thesis statement of that section. Uh, give me an example uh, of, of the manner by which it's defended, either in logic or fact uh, that, that uh, I convey. And then uh, give me your personal evaluation uh, regarding how credible uh, you do or do not think it is. And please remember some of these, right? Oftentimes, a given section will remind me of something that I, uh, uh, a thesis statement that I heard uh, from a very opinionated lecturer uh, in college or from a very opinionated writer in a book, right? So these don't, uh, entail necessarily uh, my personal beliefs, okay? Um, they, uh, to me, I, uh, I pretty much have two barometers. One is do I believe that it's halfway intelligent and thought provoking? And two, uh, do I think the thesis that I'm trying to summarize um, is relevant for history majors who are gonna go on and major in history and, and perhaps it, it I, I think it's a, um, a very, for lack of a better adjective, popular historical debate. And I want you to be familiar with before you move on to your, uh, your upper division uh, studies or graduate studies. All right. And so uh, I want to get the other names here. Uh, let's see here. Sonny. 
Sorry, I'm a terrible uh, multitasker. Uh, Kerrigan, if you don't mind, Kerrigan, if and uh, Kaleo, could you um, could you unmute and let me know what your last names are, please? I'm Kerrigan. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. I should have asked one at a time. I'm sorry. <laughs> So go ahead, Kerrigan. Oh, my last name's Rabali. Oh, okay, thank you. Let's see here. Okay, got you. And how about Kaleo? My last name is Bellen, B-E-L-E-N. There we go, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. All right. Well, yeah, happy to give you extra credit for attending and um, and nice to quasi meet you. Um, and so uh, most of the time, unless we get ahead of schedule, every now and then it, it will happen where we get ahead of schedule and I'll go ahead and give an announcement and say, OK, guys, we're not going to meet. Uh, at least we're not going to meet twice this week because uh, we're ahead of schedule on topics. Uh, but most of the time. Uh, I'm going to try to have uh, two Zoom meetings a week uh, to make sure that, that we talk about uh, every, every uh, topic as it's covered, okay? Um, but I think you'll find that you don't, you'll be accruing um, extra credit, you'll gain some context to what's written, because I'll try to give a bit of a narrative um, uh, behind uh, the given assignment. Um, Although I, 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 I'm not, I, it will not be as thorough today uh, because it's an introduction. And um, quite frankly, it's my weakest subject, uh, pre-Columbian Native Americans. Uh, fascinating to me, uh, but I've just had a hard time getting my hands on good sources. Uh, so at any rate, uh, but most of the time, I'll give you kind of a, you know, the chronological context, uh, a lecture, uh, and as well as going over the sections. Um, early in the semester, I, uh, I really just kind of um, overtly hit what the intended thesis was when we go through the meeting. Uh, and then I find it to be kind of condescending to you after a while, because I know that you can do it yourselves. And I see that with kids that, that don't come to the, the Zoom meetings and they're able to discern the thesis very effectively, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we'll, um, I'll be a little less overt uh, in the future uh, as, as the semester progresses. But that, of course, is barring any questions you have. If you ever outright ask me, Mr. Cowell, uh, I've read number two, here's what I thought, but it seems as if I'm missing the key point. I'm going to share everything I have with you. All right, so keep that in mind. Uh, you, you deserve that uh, coming to the Zoom meetings. And so any questions you have, by all means, uh, by at any time, uh, I'm, I'm evolving here, uh, trying to become acclimated to teaching online. And so uh, uh, I don't know if we want to start by having you uh, put up a hand, uh, if you could do that as a symbol, and then unmute yourself and ask me a question. Stop me anytime uh, in, in my blabbing monologues. Yes, Destiny. Um, will you be giving us feedback on our argumentative essays? I will. I will. Now, okay. to be honest, again, for the sake of time, um, I'm teaching um, three classes at your school. I'm teaching two classes at another school, and I have another, a, a third job. So I have three part-time jobs. And so uh, as the semester progresses, I probably will not give you uh, feedback on every single assignment, okay. but absolutely on the first couple. Um, okay. I, I read them thoroughly and I, I really think about what I'm writing you as far as conveying what my subjective expectations entail. And so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, question Destiny, but yes, I uh, early in the semester, I will go out of my way to make it clear to you uh, what I think about what you had written uh, where it may and may not have fit in with my subjective um, expectations. 
Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. So again, that's the least I can do. Uh, having uh, this type of format, this kind of quirky format. Uh, if you do give us feedback and it's like bad, would we be able to like resubmit it or is it just like a one-time read of submission? You know what? That's a good question. Um, I, I have nothing for that in my syllabus because I have not, I have not done that. But if you, if you demonstrate yourself to be, you know, a very ardent student and, uh, I, I could be talked into that. I could definitely be talked into that. I have nothing against it in my syllabus, so therefore I have the latitude to do that. I just had not thought of doing that, and I had not. I have not yet actually done that. Uh, but with serious students, um, I, I would probably keep it along the line, to be honest, of an exception, something that's earned, uh, mm -hmm. because it, just for the simple reason that it it'll get too chaotic. Uh, with every, you know, a vast number of you, it's a pretty big class. Uh, a couple of my classes, you're, you're talking 80 plus kids, uh, 80 plus students in each class. Um, it, it would just get a little chaotic, you know what I mean? If I just open that up as a general rule. Uh, but, but keep that in mind and just stay in contact with me uh, via Canvas message. Canvas message me. Uh, I even with you guys, uh, with the uh, with the syllabus, I even gave you a phone number. All what right. is the best way to contact you? Because actually, I emailed you, I just haven't got a response yet. So oh. I just want to know which way is best to contact you. Yeah, to be to be honest, I'm I'm terrible with emails. I'll try to catch up to that. But Canvas message is the best. Oh, that's what I meant on Canvas. Oh, you Canvas message me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because my question on Canvas was because I seen that there was like a test due on the 26th. But I, but I thought class just started yesterday. Yes. So what happens there, right? It, it's been changed. It should be changed. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. What I do is see uh, the, the class that has uh, begun uh, regular time, right? Mm -hmm. That began like, what was it? Like the 23rd of August. Yeah. Um, their first test happened to be on that day. And so I go to Canvas and especially with a test, it's very tediously time consuming. Uh, putting in, copying and pasting every question and every option, A through D. Um, and so what I could do is I, I could move, I could copy and move uh, my other courses uh, assignment okay. or test uh, to you guys. So that's okay. what I did. And it came with that, that uh, copied uh, with the same due date as the other classes uh, due date. Uh, but that should be changed. I'll go, I'll, I'll check that, okay? Oh, I'll thank you. Check that when we're done, but it, it should be rectified by now. So this week, all we're doing is the arguments of essay, right? That's right. For the first five days. Okay, got it. Thank yeah. You. So uh, no problem. Okay. Um, also, I, I have something in there on late assignments. So uh, normally, um, uh, if it's late, uh, I subtract ten points. Uh, if I have already graded it. And I, I can't remember how, I because I, it's kind of nebulous and I tried to tie it down to something less abstract. I don't know if I literally put in there a month late or something of that sort, but if it's egregiously late, like at the end of the semester, I'll probably take off at least 15 points, uh, but I'll accept and, and something is better than nothing. 35 out of 50, you get a few of those as opposed to zero out of 50s and that, that will change your grade by letters. And so uh, I try to just, you know, balance as many instructors I believe would do, uh, trying to be gracious and want as many people to pass and do well as possible, uh, but at the same time being fair to those who are doing it on time and turning in their work on time. And I grant myself the right, uh, if I had a set criteria, uh, I, you would have to meet that criteria and or else I, I couldn't exempt you. So I gave myself kind of that open latitude and said, I reserve the right on my syllabus to, uh, to make exceptions. And so of course, like at this time, uh, you know, people contend that they have COVID, that their child has COVID. Uh, I, I, that's hard to contest, you know, and stuff. So, so we're in a situation where I understand that I could be taken for granted a little bit. Uh, but I, I have to give the benefit of the doubt in cases like that and uh, death in the family, et cetera. So barring those exceptions, 
uh, yeah, I'll take off at least 10 points uh, for being late. Uh, but 40 points is a lot better than nothing. So by all means, turn in uh, everything, even if it's late. Okay. So yeah, it's it mainly consists the class of these argumentative assignments. Uh, the test after we do about four topics, we'll have a test three times. They're not cumulative, so you don't have to go over this early stuff that we're doing today uh, later on in the semester on your final. I feel like you you if you cover it once, you, that's good with me. Um, and um, what I also uh, am happy to do, I, I believe I've done it already, is, is post the test questions ahead of time and let you get an early look at them. So as you're going through the assignments, you say, okay, Native Americans, I'm choosing section number two. And you know, uh, you could say, okay, so for the next four days, that's all I need to do is, is number two, the, the, whichever one I, I choose, right? Uh, analyze and evaluate it. But then it's like, no, because in a couple weeks, we're going to have test one. So I better read numbers one through four. And I, uh, I, I should take a look at the test and see what from numbers one, three, and four uh, I could glean to get the answers uh, for the test questions. All right. And I'll also go through the test. And it's the same thing. Uh, I, I feel like i um, I'll err on the side of, 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 of spoon feeding you at first, and then I'll step back a little bit as the semester progresses. So for the first test, I will overtly go through the questions and pretty much give you the answers. Uh, I allow you to have unlimited submissions on your first test. Uh, so, you know, you should, you should theoretically ace it. Uh, test two and three, however, a one-time submission. And I may not go over all the questions. Uh, etc. But again, if you ask me a specific question and, and demonstrate to me that you've tried to discern the answer to number 19 or whatever on test two, and you can't find it in the argumentative handout, uh, I'm going to share with you, obviously. That's what I'm here for with Zoom. Okay. And so also remember that if you whatever needed, uh, for whatever reason needed to jump ahead of schedule, etc., I went ahead and pasted uh, copied from a previous semester, the summer semester, uh, the uh, lectures that I did, the Zoom lectures I did. So they're already on there. And, and so uh, by all means, if you wanted to take advantage of that, especially in, in, in light of, of, in the scenario of wanting to jump ahead, uh, feel free to do so. Okay. And then also uh, doing so much in an argumentative fashion, I, I want to have balance in my class. I want you to know the basic chronological history of the US as well. So that's why um, um, that's an additional reason why I'm doing the Zoom meetings, not just to help you with your assignments and with your test, but to give you that kind of lecture and that, that context to what's going on, uh, to what you're reading. Uh, but also I want to, um, uh, give you uh, quizzes, textbook quizzes. So I hope you uh, glean that from my uh, announcement. I need you and I apologize that I didn't do it through the school. I didn't do it on time. And when I called and tried to requisition the book, they said it was too late, that I had missed the deadline. And so I, I'm really sorry for that. And so what I do is uh, for one on your side, it should be a lot cheaper. Uh, you should be able to rent or buy a, a used edition you know, on Amazon, et cetera, uh, much more cheaply than you would have bought the book, the text from the, the, the school store. Um, and, um, but knowing that it might take you a couple of weeks to get it, uh, I'm, I'm pushing off the due dates for, for everything, for those quizzes that are based solely on the, on the textbook. Because textbooks, right, to be a textbook, you can't step on too many toes. You can't be too opinionated and get accepted oftentimes as a standard undergrad, you know, uh, broad coverage US history book. And so they, uh, they're, they're a little more um, factual where they just kind of give a narration of the events and so forth. And so I feel like you need that uh, in addition to my argumentative stuff. And so I, I feel like that balances things out. So you're still getting a basic uh, chronology 
uh, in the class. Is that the same book from your summer class? It is. Okay. That's right. All right. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Alan Brinkley, American History Connecting to the Past. Uh, and in your case, uh, it is volume one, the, the early chronological stuff, right? And, and being 17A. And I use a 15th edition, but you can go back even as far as the 12th. And I have a 12th edition around here somewhere, and, and it, it works fine uh, gleaning the same information. Just a, a lot of the differences are cosmetic. All right. So, uh, so really, that's what the class entails. Uh, predominantly argumentative assignments, tests, every about four topics that largely emanate from those argumentative assignments. Uh, I, I told you why I believe so strongly in having this type of an assignment. And then also um, to give you some chronology, I'm, I'm here to, to, to lecture with Zooms and also to uh, make you do, uh, or not make you, but ask you uh, and, and formally require that you do uh, textbook quizzes. Okay. Yes. Uh, about how long are these Zooms going to be? On a Most of the time, they're anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, All right. Um, and so, yes. Sorry. Is there oh. a certain format you want the, the argument? Is it literally, do you want it written in the style of an argumentative essay, like the five paragraph argumentative essay format? Oh, goodness, no. No, I, I'm glad I'm glad you asked that. Um, what you know what I can do is um, if I have not done it yet, is I will um, I will attach on modules, okay, uh, some sample uh, some sample responses. No, uh, to me okay, honestly, <laughs> no problem, no problem. No, I'm I'm oftentimes uh, I don't grade on length, but but most of the time I'm looking for half to three quarters of one page in your written response. So yeah, by, by no means uh, do you have to have your, you know, your citation of the thesis and what you think of it as your thesis statement, and then uh, at least three supporting paragraphs. Yeah, uh, it, God bless you. I, I won't put you through that. <laughs> that would be terrible. Yeah, uh, I already have like we're doing four of those a week, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, All especially right, cool. doing uh, with your other classes, I can only imagine, but in my class alone, uh, doing two of them a week, that'd just be too much. Okay, right on. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. So I will certainly, though, uh, give you feedback on, on the first two, three assignments. So you'll know exactly what I'm thinking as far as my expectations. Okay. The least I can do. And you'll post that on Canvas somewhere. The examples, or I, um, yes, I'll I'll put that I'll put that underneath the assignment itself. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'm glad I'm glad you asked that because I uh, I should have done that already. Just writing myself notes here. So uh, be sure to uh, be mindful of the syllabus as, as far as the schedule goes, uh, as far as the due dates, right? And um, I try to help you out with that on modules. Uh, if you'll notice, right, with each assignment, I give the dates. So be mindful of that, okay? And, and um, so you're not surprised by uh, any due dates. But yeah, we formally began on Monday. And so therefore, Friday night at midnight, uh, this first assignment is due uh, October 1st, right? Then you'll have four days for the next one, the second, the third, the fourth, and then the fifth is a Tuesday of October, and you need it by the fifth, the night of the fifth, going into the sixth by midnight uh, for the Black Legend, then the second assignment. Okay, so um, any other questions? Just one that that test one date will be changed from the 26th because I'm sure. looking at it and it literally says it's still on the 26th. 
Yeah. That okay. That the... definitely, I, I wrote a note for myself. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously. Yeah. I was a little worried. I was like, I'm supposed to take this on the class. We haven't even started. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. No, of course not. So what I have here on my calendar and it should coalesce with the syllabus is I have you taking test one uh, by the 19th of October. So it'll, that's what it'll be changed to. Uh, the due date is, is October 19th. All right. So yeah, please uh, let me know by all means. But like I said, I, I would say Destiny, my, my number one preference is Canvas message. If I am being derelict of my duty, uh, then by all means go to the, the, uh, the emergency one and go to the phone number. And uh, I can't ignore that. Uh, no matter how busy I get or flaky I get, my phone is on me. When you when you say your phone number, do you mean like a text message or a call? Uh, either one. Oh, okay. Got yeah, it. either one. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. But yeah, most of the time, so I'm not just you know inundated with calls or texts. Uh, I would prefer Canvas message. But if I'm not doing my job uh, and staying up to date on that, uh, then by all means. Uh, go ahead and use the phone and there, there's no avoiding that. And, okay. um, but yeah, so uh, just, just recall, just remember, however, though, like as far as grading everything and so forth, that uh, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And so particularly with my 17 B classes, um, they um, I'm not happy with my spring semester curriculum. And so I am constantly reading and, and in trying to improve my argumentative write-ups. And uh, so I'm doing that and I'm grading, you know, uh, four other classes as well. And so please uh, keep that in mind uh, also regarding the Canvas messages, but I'm, I'm better at Canvas messages than email. And so I, I'll catch up with my messages very soon. Okay, okay. thank you. No problem. All right, and so um, let's go ahead and take a look, if you would. Um, let me share the screen with a handout. So this is kind of a granted but approach, right? Where, whereby it states that, okay, uh, science is able to connect some dots when it comes to uh, discerning Native American history. Because with Native American history, uh, you have you have somewhat of a unique dilemma in that, let's see here, which of the following is an alleged reason for which knowledge of Native American culture and history is incomplete. Uh, a, lack of sufficient written Native American primary sources, and that is a problem. Uh, we have exceptions, uh, but the, those exceptions predominantly exist in Mesoamerica uh, and, and not, not here in the contiguous United States boundaries. Uh, and those exceptions are um, codices and stelae. Uh, with codices and stelae, as you have here, let's see here. The stelae, right, are the stones with hieroglyphic writings. And uh, they, uh, with the pictographic writings, uh, you have them predominantly in Mexico, in Guatemala and Belize. Um, we don't have that. Uh, we have some cave drawings. We have the famous uh, round counts on the hides of, of, of animals. Um, but they're not very um, integrating as far as like integrating like a, a, a few centuries worth of, of, of historical occurrences. What, what you have here with the stelae and also the codices, the codices are books, like literal ancient books. Um, you have top-down uh, great man history. And great man history doesn't imply that the people that you're studying are great morally, uh, but it implies that you want to understand what happened in that time period by way of understanding the leaders and about their personalities, about their major actions, behavior, etc. And so that's what we have from the stelae on the stones and the codices in the books. 
and Latin America. Um, it, it, it's really fascinating. So you see these pictographs right up on the top. A pictograph implies something. A pictograph underneath it together, conjointly, uh, means something uh, separate from the, the sum of the two. Yes. I don't know if I'm looking at the same screen you're looking at. Oh, shoot. Let's see here. I'm still looking at. At our, the argumentative assignment? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. How I'm about sorry. that? Yeah. Okay. You can see it now? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. And so um, uh, it's it's fascinating uh, that in the 1970s, a guy named Michael Coe supposedly broke the code, uh, C-O-E. Um, he, he supposedly finished breaking the Mayan code. And it, it's amazing because some of the symbols are um, pictographic. A picture symbolizes something, right? Then you have another symbol um, that is phonetic, that, it, that, that just does a sound. And you put the two together, the phonetic and the pictographic, and they can combine into a, a uniquely, you know, like they say synergy, right? One plus one is three. Uh, it, it's more than the sum of the two symbols. And so they, they broke that code. And then also the, the, the lines and dots are years. So you see that, right? Like um, uh, on the far right, you have two dots. And, um, and then two lines beneath them. Well, the, the dots, right, are in the ones place. And so that's just two. Uh, the five beneath it is in the tens place. So that's 50. And the five beneath that is in the hundreds place or even bigger than that. Because it didn't go, it wasn't decimal base. It was 20 based uh, by 20s. And so at any rate, uh, so you add those lines together uh, the line is five, but it's but it's multiplied by what place it's in, and the dots at the top are ones, and so that says how many years later, uh, and then the pictographs above that, as well as the picture beneath it, demonstrate what happened that many years after the previous event had been recorded. It, it, it's fascinating, um, this Mayan code, so they're able to discern that right uh, in Latin America. But we don't have that here in the U.S. And so we're, we're groping. We're trying to infer, right? We're, we're relying upon inference, finding a dot here and a dot there and trying to connect the dots. All right. And so, um, for instance, uh, connecting the dots is uh, a couple things is you have C. Vance Haynes and his theory. And he said, you know what? But when you do isotope analysis, you can discern uh, a Scandinavian uh, scientist uh, in the 1800s uh, came up with a theory of the, uh, the ice ages, that there had been ice ages uh, ge geologically. And through isotope analysis and all kinds of other uh, employments of science, they discerned that the latest one was likely 13,000 years ago, known as the Wisconsin era. And when they did, and they saw evidence of the moving of two glaciers, the Cordilleran and the, uh, I can't remember the other one, uh, a, a Lucid? No, at any rate, the two ice sheets went over most of North America and the coast with a gap, with a corridor, right, between the two. And so therefore, they surmised that through uh, water displacement during that Wisconsin era, the shallow Bering Sea became bare, and uh, they were able to traverse it, to walk through it. And the uh, ice-free corridor between the two humongous glaciers uh, offered a walkway, if you will, for uh, the Native Americans to pass through. All right. Then in addition to that, through that type of analysis, 
is they, they studied mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondria, right, is, is, comes from uh, the mother uh, uh, in, in uh, going into the, um, the, the, oh goodness, I can't think of the word, when, what we all begin as in, uh, in the mother. Uh, through the child. At any rate, uh, the mitochondria is found uh, is, is, is passed from the mother to kids. And so they look through the mitochondria and they look for common um, haplogroups, as they call them, uh, genetic markers that are, that are found uh, through the mother's line. And what they found is uh, three or four of the major haplogroups that have been identified by uh, alleged Native Americans in the 1990s study, uh, they contended, like the Diego Allel, the GMAT, uh, were also found in people that were uh, tested, their DNA tested uh, in modern day Siberia. So to them, right, that constituted uh, genetic ties uh, between those living in Siberia and those living in uh, and, and Native Americans here. Now that has been contested. To some scientists, anthropologists, et cetera, it, it's not convincing enough. And you also have some cultural ties a shared belief in pantheism, uh, a great spirit inhabits all things. All things are interconnected to that great spirit. Uh, moieties are uh, spirit animals that, uh, that symbolize uh, each clan. And going and identifying moieties and organizing uh, village life according to Moides. Uh, spiritual versus material dualism, the metaphysical world versus the, uh, you know, Kant's phenomenal realm of what your five senses can discern. Uh, placating the, the, the gods or the spirits, especially through the use of a shaman, a religious middle person, an intermediary between the physical realm and the metaphysical one. Even a couple religious vocabulary terms and hunting terms have been shared across Alaska from Siberia to, native, to, to North America. However, when you look at anthropology, right? Those are very, very common cultural and religious characteristics found throughout all continents, not just Siberia and, and America. Some even uh, contended that there's evidence in the epicanthic fold that, 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 that uh, formulates the proverbial almond eyes. So, you know, you have scientists that are doing their best to try to come up with a narrative of what has happened with North American, in particular, for U.S. history, right? What has happened in Native American history? So some of them begin here. In the Wisconsin era, 13,000 years ago, during the latest alleged ice age, that they came across the Bering Sea, the Bering Strait, uh, from Siberia here. But it's not, it's still contested to this day. So notice we're talking about inference. They're doing their best to infer. Radiocarbon 14 dating. Right, seeing how much carbon-14 is emitted from a substance is missing. Uh, stratigraphy, as you see on this at the bottom here, uh, at different stratigraphic levels, 
supposedly the sediment changes the amount of minerals and, and composition and the percentage of what mineral, et cetera, right, uh, changes, but is shared within a given stratigraphic level. And of course, right, you're looking at uh, porous, uh, non-porous to non-porous boundaries, right? Whereby the, the water, the natural process of erosion seem to be stopped. Um, however, or at least slowed down and then to areas, then to the next level and so forth. And um, as you see there in that picture, it's probably not a coincidence that they found like those old crustaceans down at the lowest. You see about in the middle, they find the big carnivorous dinosaur bones. with properties that are inherent to that section underground. So you have stratigraphy, climatology, epidemiology, ice core sampling, pollen analysis, molecular biology. A lot of these I'm just gonna state because it's way over my head. I'm a social science guy. That's why I teach history and not science. But at any rate, what happens? They carbon date in 1997 in Chile, human remains about 13,000 years old and objects carbon dated 30,000 years old. Intelligently designed, allegedly human made objects. Well, if humans were around to make an object 30,000 years ago, so much for them not coming until 13,000 years ago during the latest ice age. So that 1997 carbon date threw a monkey wrench in C. Vance Haynes' theory. But look at the so-called eras, if you will. Sumerians and Mesopotamia, 3000 BC. Irrigated farming, a centralized bureaucracy, complex society of multiple classes, writing, a law code, mathematics, astronomy, And the list goes on here. Egypt, 3,100 BC. See some of the same characteristics. Irrigated farming, centralized bureaucracy, a complex society of multiple classes, writing, architecture. The Indus Valley in India, the Harappan uh, civilization, Mohenjo-Daro had running water, Yellow River in China, the Shia dynasty. So here's what we do is we put them in these categories here. The old stone told age, uh, uh, the Paleolithic era, they contend 2 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. Then you're supposed to have actually between one and two, the Neolithic revolution, the new stone tool revolution of farming. Then the formative or pre-classic era from that time of farming, which goes back about 10,000 years ago, if, if the science can be trusted, but it's changed. It's gone they, uh, through the 1960s, there was a guy named uh, McNeish or McNeil, and his group in the 60s came back to about 5,000 years ago. 
And then right about 2000, they found evidence elsewhere in Mexico that they carbon dated uh, cultivation uh, to be dated 10,000 years ago. So who knows what we're gonna continue to find. But from that time period, about 8,000 BC, up to about 150 AD and the Western you know, uh, civilizations, Gregorian calendar was the formative period. In that period, I think of Tiwanaku down in South America, uh, a city that they found uh, before Christ. I think of, of course, the Olmec, O-L-M-E-C, by 1800 BC at San Lorenzo and other places. And the classic era usually is monopolized in the history sections by the Maya. As the post-classic is usually monopolized by the Mexica or the Aztec as well as the, um, the Inca in South America. So when we look at this, this era, right? Notice everything I mentioned, the Neolithic or new stone tool or farming revolution 8,000 years ago, where did I mention? Mexico. Formative or pre-classic civilization, the Olmec, Mexico, Tiwanaku, what is it? Ecuador, Bolivia, South America. The classic era, the Maya, Guatemala, Belize, Mexico. The post, -con or the post classic, the Aztec, Mexico. The Inca, Peru. Nothing, nothing in the United States. And that's why it's, it's a conquest game to some people. Is why are we talking about when they had running water, when they farmed, when they developed a complex society, et cetera, et cetera. Because those who won politically, who colonized the land, who dispossessed the land, right? The Euro-Americans, the Americans of European heritage. They dictated what the measuring stick would be for that which constitutes a civilized environment. I should have a slide down here, bear with me right there. And anthropology largely follows this as an assumption, as a theory, regarding facets of cultural evolution, going from primitive to civilized. Firstly, how well do you manipulate the landscape around you? Secondly, do you have capacity for large complex settlements, urban stratified cities? Thirdly, do you engage in literary, artistic, and scientific development? And is there evidence of such? Fourthly, how is your technological innovation? And fifthly, what's your religious worldview? So again, going to anthropology, the notion is, is that mankind in virtually all areas of the globe began in simple small bands as hunter-gatherers, especially through, right, the Paleolithic era, uh, the old stone tool era where they hunted what they called the megafauna, the big animals. Then eventually, varying from place to place, they learn how to cultivate uh, grains, right? In the case of, of the Americas, it's the three sisters, uh, corn, beans, and squash. 
And from that is supposedly this, this farming revolution is to, supposed to engage, uh, serve as a catalyst for many other changes towards civilized status. To employ a lot of people in agricultural work. Or to, in, in, to yeah, to employ a large number, you need a hierarchy. You need someone who could command authority to force people to labor. Then people might come and want to steal what you're growing during harvest time. So you need a standing army to protect your food. Then with all the vagaries of weather and the, the, the variables that you can't control, you need a sacerdotal, like the word sacerdote priest in Spanish. You need a religious elite. Uh, to try to um, accommodate the forces beyond man's control to make sure that a good harvest comes in. So what do you know? A lot of uh, um, communities throughout the globe in history, when they began to farm, uh, what seemed to have been their key uh, god and, and their polytheistic many-god pantheon was either the sun god or a fertility god. Then with working, uh, the, uh, working on crops is not everyone needs to, and you're going to have some, some leisure time. And so then thus you could develop a, a diverse, complex society of artisans, of skilled workers, who could not only build necessities, but build things that are desirable and not necessarily needed. And then I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once your material needs are met, once you feel safe, you and your family, you could contemplate bigger things, more esoteric things, like the meaning of life, and so you could indulge in intellectual inquiry or philosophy, develop more of a complex religion. Engage in literary pursuits, artistic pursuits, etc. So at any rate, in the Americas. The Paleolithic era is the same, as you see here. We had big camels. We had, look at that middle thing. That's a sloth. Yikes. So you had sloths and camels. We had lions. We had, of course, the mastodon and the woolly mammoth. And you find them excavated at the same stratigraphic level as humans who had hunting paraphernalia, like the famous Chalcedon chipped um, uh, flute spears that you see at the top of the slide there. In some cases, those intelligently devised spearheads were lodged into the rib cage of the megafauna of the big animals. So that's pretty good evidence that they were contemporaries and that humans hunted them, right? So we have that. And by the way, they found many of them uh, first became famous in the mid-1900s in Clovis, New Mexico. So we call them the Folsom or the Clovis culture. So that works out in other places as well, chronologically. But the farming revolution, right? As you saw in those slides, right? Um, they were meeting most of the criteria, the Euro-American criteria for civilized status by about 3000 BC. You don't have that comparable in the Americas. Not yet, hasn't been discovered yet. 
But again, you go to 1800 BC and look at the Olmec. Cities, masonry, trade networks, engage in writing, astronomy, the origins of the long count calendar that the Maya were famous for, the use of zero as early as the Babylonians. Ceremonial centers, urban areas of, 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 of uh, impressive population. Then you jump forward to about 250 AD, if the, if the dating can be deemed correct, uh, to about 800 AD. And you have the, the heyday, if you will, of the, um, of the Maya. Chichen Itza and Teotihuacan are not it. Well, they're somewhere here on this slide. And I'll put this slide online, okay? What did I do with the Maya? I know I had them. Why well, should I take that back? Um, I had more than this. I'll look on another slide because I, I was really interested in the Maya. At any rate, go to the U.S. territory. And the formation of those types of societies seem to come in about this, this type of um, order. Firstly, in the Southwest. Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada. And of course that, not as much as now, but that was an arid area. So that's pretty surprising, right? That civilized areas, oftentimes when you look in human history, uh, emanate near water and very fertile ground, but not the case in the US. First appeared in the Southwest, the Hohokam, the Anasazi and the Mogollon in particular. Then the mound cultures, like the Hopewell culture. And I'll tell you what, keep in mind with the mound cultures, Cahokia isn't until about 1000 AD. But before Christ, you had the Adena. And they are just beginning to unpeel the onion on the Adena. Very, very interesting. Then from the 1200s up into the 1500s, you had some Eastern woodland natives like the Iroquois uh, kind of experienced their heyday by that European criteria. Manipulation of the environment, complex society, irrigated farming, artistic, literary, and scientific development. So let's take a look, for example, at the first area. Farming and irrigation, buildings, neighborhoods, temples, courts, pottery, textiles, art, trade. They had copper from Lake Manitoba in Canada. They had goods from the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico by the time of Christ. Their knowledge of astronomy was incredible. And you can't see it well behind the names, but they're famous, right, for their cities. Hence the term Pueblo that was given to them by the Spaniards, uh, their descendants. And with the Pueblo, right? Uh, just incredible. Look up uh, Chaco Canyon. Look up Pueblo Bonito. 
very, very interesting cities uh, devised by the Native Americans by the time of Christ. But remember, ask yourself, why do the Native Americans have to play this game? Why do they have to defend themselves and prove that they engaged in cultural evolution in a timely fashion themselves? They met this Euro-American and European criteria themselves. Why? To prove that they should have kept their land? Because that was part of the legal argument used by jurists, J-U-R-I-S-T-S, uh, legal uh, interpreters of the laws of Castile and Aragon back in Spain and of England as they were colonizing the Americas in the 15 and 1600s. They used terms like tierra vacia, empty land in Spanish, virgin soil in English contending that the Native Americans weren't doing anything with the land. And so therefore they didn't deserve to keep it. So, wow, you could decide that a certain demographic, a certain people have not lived up to your expectations of civilized status and therefore you have the right to dispossess them of their land. Yikes. Look out for the next group that's more civilized than you are. But that's what they do in the American history books, is they do what's found in the book 1491. They contend, hey, the Native Americans lived up to that criteria, maybe not on equal terms with the old world, but pretty darn well, especially in light of the fact that they did it on their own. They couldn't piggyback. You look at the Spanish, right? The Spanish had Greeks coming and colonizing the Mediterranean coast just millennia ago. Rome colonized Spain, which was called Iberia at that time, and renamed it Hispania. And so Rome mined, brought in metallurgy. Uh, the Celtic people moved in and brought in metallurgy and farming before that with the Iberians. The Romans brought in all kinds of things that would be considered the synchronon of civilization by 250 BC. Then, of course, you have the North African Moors that came in 711 AD. And look at Cordoba and Granada. Look at the great Alhambra Palace, where they had a renaissance in Cordoba. This Muslim uh, sultan, or basha of the sultan. Very, very sophisticated poetry, mathematics, etc. The Muslims brought to Spain. And then, of course, right, uh, by way of the Crusades, etc., they got access to Asian gunpowder. So, yeah, by the time they come in 1492, Christopher Columbus says, all oh, these Caribbean natives are so primitive. They don't even know what a sword is. They grab our swords and cut their hands out of ignorance. They're frightened of our fire sticks, as they call them, our guns and our cannons, and claim that they weren't magic. So see how primitive they are? Well, Spain pretty much borrowed everything that it felt superior about from someone else. The Native Americans were on their own isolated by the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. So at any rate, 
you have the Mississippian mound cultures. The most famous is Cahokia. But like I said, the Adena, they're just beginning to learn about them. Very ornate uh, burial grounds. Head leaders who were a lot taller, by the way, than everyone else. I don't know. They think that there's some connection there with just literally their height alone. Buried with all types of paraphernalia. Tens of thousands of mounds have been discovered on the plains, up and down the Mississippi River, and in the southeast. So they engaged in celestial uh, observations. And like the Native Americans in the Southwest, like the Native Americans in Mesoamerica, they are oftentimes fixated with Venus. Some of their hieroglyphics in the Southwest in particular are tied to the hieroglyphics in Mesoamerica. So did, did they profit from diffusion, from borrowing culturally from Mesoamericans who may have traveled and traded with them or migrated? We still don't know. Then after the mound culture, there's Cahokia. Uh, it's covered by our names. They think Cahokia near present-day St. Louis, Missouri, um, by 1000 AD, had as many as uh, possibly, um, gosh, some people, some people get up over, uh, I, I've seen terms as high as 60,000. And the Eastern Woodlands, like the Iroquois, they're known for their famous longhouse and the type of almost, almost socialism that they practiced. They had a famous League of Peace for which they became known for trying to keep the peace, although they, they clearly had war and there's evidence of warfare. The Appalachian in Florida were just as organized, densely populated, and riddled with evidence of complexity of the population of multiple classes, uh, a, a clear political hierarchy, a powerful armed force, a sophisticated religion as the Iroquois. But we're talking mainly from about 1200 to about 1500s. So I want to go back to the handout, if you don't mind. So science, right? Scientists have made some impressive gains. Dendrochronology, the study of tree rings. Radiocarbon dating. Thermoluminescence dating. Suboceanic isotope analysis. A lot of these I'm just writing down, okay? because I, I don't begin to understand the intricacies of these. Stratigraphy. So they try their best to put together rough dates, chronological cases. But again, when you look at the Mississippian, the, 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 let's do first and second chronologically, right? Mention first the Southwestern, 
then the Mississippi River, Mississippian cultures, mound cultures. And many occasions, the dating processes seem to indicate that they had sudden perplexing ends to their reign, to their heyday. And suddenly everything stopped. And of course, you could look for soot, battle wounds in the, in the skeletons, and look for evidence, right, of them being destroyed militarily. And in many of these cases, they don't find it. So the, the fall of some of these empires in, in Native America are, are riddled with questions as to why suddenly everyone seemed to just evacuate that area and stop building and stop engaging in those cultural practices, et cetera. It's just one more reason for which studying before Columbus, pre-Columbian Native Americans is a puzzle, perhaps frustratingly so. So many answers we're still looking for. So in number one, granted, science has discerned some impressive things, but there's still so much that it has not ascertained. For instance, C. Vance Haynes and his theory of Native Americans coming from Siberia 13,000 years ago across the ice-free corridor down into the Americas. And by the way, when they studied the ice-free corridor, they found very little carbon footprint. I jokingly call it like Burger King wrappers, evidence of them having lived and passed through that area, refuse, etc. So it's frustrating. There's still so much we don't know. So hence, at the bottom of the first uh, paragraph of section one, it says, nevertheless, science can only take us so far. And that was intended to be my thesis. Number two, pretty clear on the title there, right, as to what the message is meant to be conveyed on number two. Historical investigation causes Native American stereotypes to crumble. And the stereotypes are that they were primitive, that the land was scarcely inhabited and scarcely manipulated, that they were all the same at the same hunter-gatherer or primitive beginning Neolithic stage of development. And several several points prove otherwise. Eleven or so distinct cultural areas. So much for them all being monolithic or the same or homogenous, right? And not to mention, the uh, those prior to the Adena, or possibly even the Adena in the early stages, those in the Pacific Northwest, like they're the, near Washington State and the Pacific Coast, had many of the trappings of what Euro Americans would call civilization. Complex societies, dense populations and cities, philosophical, artistic, technological advancements and endeavors, but no farming. Well, they thought that it was an axiom that you don't question. Farming brings those changes about, enables those endeavors to exist. Well, evidently not. They were able to do it without farming. 
So what other assumptions do we have might be wrong? So number two, saying no, they, they were heterogeneous. They were diverse. They were plentiful in number. And I have some numbers on that. The Americas hosted between 75 and 100 million inhabitants, they think. And that goes back and forth, to be honest. While all of Europe was comprised at that time of only 70 million. And they met the requirements for civilization pretty darn well. The Mexica or the Aztec, if you include all the Americas, my goodness. Libraries, schools, hospitals, sophisticated political structure. They engaged in human sacrifice, as many of the Mesoamericans did. And the Spaniards aren't going to take lightly to that. But Spaniards wrote and said, Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, the capital of the Aztec Empire. They said, put Seville, Spain in the dirt in comparison, in the dust. Look up Tikal, T-I-K-A-L, Monte Alban. Teotihuacan, the city of the gods. Impressive stuff. Especially um, astronomically. And architecturally. So you see here at the bottom. European conquerors wanted to justify dispossession of Native American lands by convincing the world and future generations that Native America was inhabited by small numbers of primitive childlike natives who shared a common backward culture and lifestyle, far behind on humanity's cultural evolutionary path toward modernity. This simply is not true. So nothing too sophisticated about my thesis so far. But I'm trying to convey a lot of the data while I'm doing this as well. And have you become familiar with some of the basic facts that are often found in the textbook? Number three, okay. I'm not saying that it is okay. I'm saying it is what it is, that certain traits that Native Americans shared in common brought about, kind of caused or elicited condescension and maltreatment from Euro-Americans. Certain cultural characteristics that Native Americans shared cause the Europeans to feel superior to them. And look into those. Pantheism. Everything's connected to one spirit. The Bible makes a very clearly delineated and separated holy Judeo-Christian Trinity God. Separate from his creation. The Euro Americans were Christian, at least culturally and institutionally, when they came in the early modern era of the 15 and 1600s AD. The use of shamanism to them, right? That was idolatry, that was superstition. 
and the Native Americans not having a modern notion of proprietorship, of ownership of private property. They allotted private property, but not in the proprietorship. They used it as usufruct, uh, that you could use it, but not that it was indefinitely owned by you as a private individual. Heaven forbid the Native Americans were not capitalists. And however unfairly this, this was, this happened, is they were looked down upon by Euro-Americans for such. All right, so are there any questions about numbers one through three? what I intended to convey. Can I get a thumbs up that you guys have been able to hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions? It's such a broad topic. It's it's daunting. So now let's take a look at the test. See if you have any last minute questions before we leave. I don't wanna keep you much longer. You've definitely earned your extra credit points today. So which of the following is an alleged reason for which knowledge of Native American culture and history is incomplete? A, lack of sufficient written Native American sources. That's true. B, C. Van Tain's theory on Native American immigration from Asia does not dovetail with all carbon dated objects discovered. That's also true. C, alleged cultural, linguistic, and biological ties between Native Americans and indigenous Siberians have not convinced academia universally. That also is true. And European chronicles are alleged by many to be ethnocentric and skewed. Absolutely. Because the idea, right, is can we really be capable, even with the best of intentions, of objectively observing and analyzing and evaluating a foreign culture and people without bringing in our own lens, our own worldview of how we see the world and explain it, what we think is right and what we think is wrong with it, and what the key objectives to life are, what we believe to be normative behavior of right and wrong, taboo. Aren't we going to bring that with us whether we want to or not? So some people contend that the European chroniclers, even if they were the, had the best of intentions, they were by nature they were ethnocentric. They were they were tied to their own culture, to their own worldview, and couldn't truly objectively see and evaluate the Native Americans. And then worse than that, you might say, is some didn't even try to hide the fact that they were trying to justify taking land from the Native Americans. So some of them had an ax to grind when they wrote as chroniclers about Native Americans. You see number three, what was mentioned is common cultural traits. That's found in number three. And you see the top one, a religious tendency toward animism, shamanism, polytheism, and pantheism.
All right, so are there any questions? Any questions or comments? You haven't died of boredom yet? Good, good, good. All right, and so I have your names. Uh, you will definitely get your extra credit. I, I'll add it to your score, okay, on, on assignment number one. That's how it works. So for each assignment that we cover, if you're there for that meeting, you should have points added to your raw score. And you should see those points when I submit them with my comments. So be sure, uh, by all means, hold me accountable. But I have my chart here with me. It should be no problem. I, I won't forget. I do it with all my classes. A quick question. About how long does it take for you to grade? Oh, gosh. I usually take anywhere, you know, because some are short and sweet. And I could tell mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like I take between a minute uh, to four minutes to grade each person's thing because I'm trying to hurry. That's actually hurrying. Uh, but oftentimes mm -hmm. it's closer to four minutes on the first two assignments. And like I said, I have 80 plus of you and I have other classes. Right. So it, well, it, I was it, just curious. I mean, if it's going to take weeks to get grades. Oh, back. no, 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 no. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. I, I see no, what you're asking. Okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. Um, no, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, to at, at least grade your first assignment uh, roughly by the time. This is my aim is to grade your first assignment by the time your second assignment is due. Oh, so okay. You cool. have, uh, have received input before you finally submit your second assignment. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, thank you. It's nice to meet you guys. I wish I could meet you in person, um, but um, this, this will have to do. And so uh, uh, you have your points, um, I'm finished. And so you guys have a, a nice couple of days and I, I hope to see you on Thursday, okay, at four o'clock. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone, you too.